Hi everyone. Welcome to the first video covering Chapter 6 from your Computer Systems book. In Chapter 6 we will learn about how computer systems store and access data. We will start at the beginning with Section 6.1, which covers some basics about storage technologies. Specifically, we'll talk briefly about RAM, hard disks, and solid state drives. Let's start with Random Access Memory, or RAM. RAM traditionally comes as a chip. The basic storage unit is called a cell and stores one bit per cell. Multiple RAM chips form a memory. It comes in two varieties, static RAM or SRAM and dynamic RAM or DRAM. This table shows some comparisons between SRAM and DRAM. First, let's make sure we're clear on what all the terms here mean. The trans bit per column means how many transistors per bit are used. You can see that SRAM uses four or six transistors per bit while DRAM uses only one. The next column addresses the relative access times between the two types. This column indicates that the access time for DRAM is 10 times as long as the access time for SRAM, so DRAM is significantly slower. The Needs Refresh column shows us that the values stored in SRAM are stable and don't need to be rewritten periodically. In the case of DRAM, the values stored are not persistent and need to be refreshed periodically by reading out every bit stored in memory and then writing it all back in. EDC stands for Error Detecting Code and applies to finding errors in cache memories and what to do when we find those errors. DRAM requires EDC and SRAM may or may not. We'll cover more on this later in the course. The cost in this table refers to the monetary cost of the two types of RAM. As you can see, SRAM costs on the order of 100 times more than DRAM, which tells us why we don't just use SRAM for everything. And the last column shows us applications that the two types tend to be used for. When we talk about cache memory later in the chapter, we'll see why SRAM is well suited for use in cache memory. So DRAM and SRAM are what are called volatile memories. They lose all of their information when they're powered off. Non-volatile memories retain their values even when they're powered off. This list shows some non-volatile memories that you can, you can find in various kinds of electronic devices, and the uses are very familiar to us. BIOS controllers, solid state disks, flash drives, phones, etc. all use non-volatile memories. Next, we'll talk about disk drives. First, let's look very briefly at the physical components of a hard drive to get a basic idea of how they operate. A hard drive's platters are the physical part of the hard drive responsible for storing data. The spindle is the part of the hard drive that's responsible for spinning the platter so that the device's read and write arm can access and save data. The read and write arm, also called the actuator arm, is part of the hard drive that reads data already stored on the platter and writes new data on the platter. The actuator arm is connected to a part called the actuator that controls the positioning of the actuator arm relative to the disk platter. The actuator works with the spindle motor to position the actuator arm so it lines up with the platter to read and write data. Now, the platters we mentioned in the last slide each have two surfaces divided into concentric rings called tracks. These tracks are broken up by gaps into individual sectors. So let's take a look at what goes into the time it takes to read information from a disk. Let's assume the disk just read data contained in the sector that's colored blue. The time it takes to read that sector is called the transfer time. Then it needs to read data from the sector colored red, so the next step is to find that sector on the physical media. This operation is called a seek. Then we have some time that's taken because the platters have to rotate to the right place for the actuator arm to actually read from that physical location. The time that takes is called rot the rotational latency. Finally, it reads the sector, and so on, we just repeat that process. Individual access times can vary based on where the sectors we're reading from are located relative to one another, so let's talk about the average time disk access takes. We can approximate the average time to access a target sector by adding the average seek, rotation, and transfer times together. The seek time is the time it takes to position the heads over the cylinder containing the target sector. The rotational latency is the time it takes for the first bit of the target sector to pass under the read-write head. Read, write, head. Finally, the transfer time is the time it takes to read the bits in the target sector. So, if we have a 7200 RPM or revolutions per minute disk with an average seek time of 9 milliseconds and an average of 400 sectors per track, we can substitute those values into the expressions from the previous slide to determine our average access time. The important thing to take away from this 
is that the access time is dominated by the seek and rotation time. Basically, the most time-consuming part of the process is finding the first bit we're interested in. The actual read time is much faster than the other times that go into the average access time, which is why we say that the first bit is very expensive and the rest are basically free. Also, we find that disks are about 40,000 times slower than static RAM and 2,500 times slower than dynamic RAM. So, on to those solid state disks. Solid state disks consist of flash memory arranged into blocks, which contain the pages that data actually gets written to. Each block contains 32 to 128 pages, each of which can contain 512 bytes to 4 kilobytes of data. Actually, newer and larger SSDs now have page sizes of 2, 4, 8, or 16 kilobytes, and blocks containing 128 or 256 pages, but otherwise they work the same way. Some things to remember is that a page can be written to only after the block containing it has been completely erased, and the block will wear out after about 100,000 repeated writes, so SSDs will wear out over time. This table shows some of the standard speeds for reading and writing to and from a solid state drive. Notice that sequential access is faster than random access, which is common at all levels of the memory hierarchy. So, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using SSDs over HDDs? That's solid state drives over hard disk drives. The advantage of an SSD is that they are faster, more rugged, and consume less power because there are no moving parts. The disadvantages include the potential to wear out, although that does take quite a while, and the increased expense involved. However, many users are finding the increase in speed to be reason enough to accept the greater expense, and SSDs are becoming more standard in notebooks, desktops, and servers. This graph shows us the differences in speed between the various types of memory we've talked about and CPU cycle time. As you can see, the gap just keeps getting wider over time, so what can we do to use the memory technologies we have in the most effective ways? We'll talk about some answers to that question in the next few videos. And that does it for this video. In the next video, we'll talk about Section 2 of Chapter 6, covering locality.